Anthony Fantano. Chances are, even if you don't watch him, you've likely heard of his name. He's one of, if not the largest tastemakers in music, with over 900 million views across his multiple channels on YouTube. This is especially impressive when you take into account that he's done this all alone, effectively the head of his own one-man empire. In spite of his popularity, however, in recent years he's become somewhat controversial amongst his former audience. And to those newer to his channel, this is confusing because in the grand scheme of things he's done nothing wrong. The worst anyone could say about him without having to substantiate their claims, really, is that he's kind of annoying and has bad takes. To an outsider, the vitriol towards him seems rather overblown, and I'm not going to argue that it isn't. Insert disclaimer here about how he's not a bad guy, and I don't hate him, or whatever. However, his former fans do have a reason to feel the way they do, and it's not super easy to point out just why they've become so miffed by him. In this video, I'm going to explain why they feel so betrayed, and how in the larger context of his channel, the Anthony of today is antithetical to what he represented before. This is the story of how counterculture cannibalized the needle drop. Fantano began his pursuit as a music critic in 2007, with the first iteration of The Needle Drop beginning as a public radio show. He eventually also launched a blog to accompany it where he would post additional written reviews. Back then, podcasting as a medium was rudimentary and uncertain, hence how he managed to pitch the show in the first place. He was satisfied at first, but after two years realized that his growth was becoming stagnant. His target audience just weren't the type to tune into the radio, an already withering medium that was continuing to lose its relevance among young people. Weighing his options, he eventually chose to continue exploring means through the internet, eventually finding the unique format that would skyrocket him to popularity, YouTube. Hey guys, Anthony Fantano here, the internet's busiest music nerd, doing an album review, MGMT's Congratulations. Having created his YouTube channel in January of 2009, he's since amassed over 2 million subscribers and been cited by journalists as today's most successful music critic. His struggle to reach his target demographic paid off, with him not only finding success but becoming ingrained in online music culture. He's been directly referenced and sampled by several artists, and he's even had his audience's taste in music labeled Fantano Core. Fantano's influence as a tastemaker cannot be understated, and I have to give him props for that. He's living the life that most internet critics could only dream of, but that level of notoriety isn't achieved by simply uploading videos consistently. As Fantano himself notes in a profile by Spin, there were many other up-and-coming channels back then who never experienced the same growth or success he did, nonetheless the cult of personality. So what was it that set Fantano apart from his competitors and allow him to tower above the rest? While Fantano humbly cites it as a simple stroke of luck, there's clearly another explanation. The one thing that separated Fantano from the other channels at the time was how closely he aligned himself with the internet's counterculture. Fantano didn't just understand his demographic, he was his demographic. At a time when the internet hadn't yet been adopted by pop culture at large, Fantano was unique in how close he was to the pulse of it all. Or, as M. Lemon would autistically scream at you, Fantano was well versed in memes. His reviews were filled with quirky humor and bits like Cal Chichesta, in contrast to sanitized corporate publications such as Pitchfork. I was throwing up on a Tuesday. I think it's cause I eat too much food, hey. He wasn't just trying to make video reviews, he was trying to provide an experience unique to a medium like YouTube. Just listen to his philosophy regarding YouTube from back in 2016. That you sort of appreciate that YouTube is this internet med medium, you know, and there's kind of like a DIY characteristic to it that makes it so appealing. Mm. Uh, whereas, you know, th there are some people who I think have missed the point. There are some people who have gotten on YouTube just, just to, to kind of make TV. You know? Yeah. Whereas, yeah, exactly. like, to me, that's not the point of YouTube. Separating him even more from his competitors was his association with 4chan's music board, to the point where he was unceremoniously crowned as the king of Mew. This wasn't just for his music taste, but the fact that he was an open poster of the forum. In 2014, Anthony participated in a four hour long QA session with users of the site. He would also collaborate with other e-celebs associated with the edgier side of the internet, such as Filthy Frank and even Sam Hyde. However, all of this would prove to be preamble for what was his most elaborate bid yet. While Anthony's philosophy of creating experiences strictly for the internet often crept into his main reviews, it would become the entire basis for his third channel, that is the plan. You're just really stretching it at that point. Here's a fat guy. Here's a fat guy. 
here's a fat guy. Am I doing this one right? The channel was filled with bizarre meme-centric videos with esoteric editing and abrasive delivery. Even to this day, these videos still hold up as his comedic abilities were finally allowed to shine. In contrast to his mild-mannered music reviews, his association with these edgier acts began to make more sense as he indulged in slightly more offensive humor. In 2017, the channel sat at around 400,000 subscribers, nearly half the subscriber count of his main channel, and managed to garner a very loyal audience separate from his other more serious endeavors. However, as you've likely guessed by now, the success wouldn't to last forever. One of the first instances of his association with more controversial humor backfiring occurred in late 2015. A common trend across 4chan's many boards is framing their favorite e-celebs for committing heinous acts of mass murder. This was done to the aforementioned Sam Hyde, as well as Eggy, which I've previously discussed in a video. Well, this happened to Fantano as well, when in October of that year, a student opened fire on their college campus shortly after writing a post warning others on the site. Posters were quick to note the shooter's similar appearance to Fantano, and saw this as an opportunity to frame him by sending in photos of Anthony claiming he was the gunman. Their efforts were so successful that his face was shown next to the actual perpetrator's words on live television, broadcasted to hundreds of thousands of people. Some of you guys are alright. Don't go to school tomorrow if you're in the Northwest. A happening thread will be posted tomorrow morning. So long, space robots. Some who read it actually encouraged him. Fantano didn't take this lightly, opting to take legal action against the station, which is honestly justifiable. He commented on the incident that, I think it says a lot about the state of journalism and its complete madness, the first of what would eventually become a series of brawls with the media. In spite of the conflict, Anthony wasn't deterred from associating with controversial political figures and provocateurs. That next month, Anthony appeared on a live stream with Sargon of Akkad, where they discussed social justice and music. And in January of 2016, he did his interview with Sam Hyde, two endeavors that solidified his place in that ethos of the internet. Someone who is not afraid to push the envelope in terms of humor and stand by those scoffed at by the media at large. Everything about this would change in the years following. With the election of Donald Trump in 2016, politics became more inflammatory than ever online. Where it was once expected for creators to remain neutral, it soon became seen as their responsibility to be advocates. And this meant the inverse as well, where having the wrong politics or even being associated with the wrong politics was often enough to make or break your career. In late 2016, Sam Hyde would infamously have his television show canceled by Adult Swim after an article highlighting the more political aspects of his show, Million Dollar Extreme, was published. In a post-Trump election world, everyone's political opinions were fair game, and most media outlets were willing to go for the throat. All the while, Anthony was appearing in videos like Questions for SJWs, where he'd say things like this. Have you guys tried drinking this shit? It's great. With a target on his back as the face of online music curation, and having already been seen as questionable for his associates and provocative humor, it wouldn't be long before Anthony himself fell victim to a hit piece. On October 3rd of 2017, The Fader published an article titled, The Needle Drop Pioneered Music Review Blogs. His lesser known channel was a bid to win the alt-right. As its headline suggests, it was an attempt to portray Anthony as a goon to the alt-right, with its thesis centering around the That Is The Plan channel. One of the first paragraphs in the article reads, up until this afternoon, October 3rd, Anthony had another booming YouTube channel, practically unknown outside of his fan base, but immensely popular within it, called That Is The Plan. His vocabulary took on a screechy, 4chan friendly slant. Video titles from the past year include Pepe the Frog Triggers Hillary Clinton, I Changed My Gender Cause Donald Trump, and Mega Cuck Says Pokemon Go Is Like Dog Fighting. He raged against SJWs and feminists, and in video after video, treated black musicians as a punchline. The author goes on to explain the various associations I've discussed here. Before four singling out instances from his meme channel that they claimed were politically problematic. These examples, while maybe convincing to someone not literate of the internet, are actually pretty dog shit. They range from simply pointing out him referencing memes from 4chan, writing, Here he throws in a little easter egg for 4chan heads. When his voice is edited to say, Keck, a background image of Shrek with the title Photoshop to read Keck appears. You should have something on your neck. Keck. Keck is a popular 4chan meme. To flat out misrepresenting jokes to have an exaggerated racial slant, they try to portray his mockery of Hobson as something more than just him ripping on cringy lyrics. And here, the author writes that Fantano wraps a cord around his neck, while an image of a black guy with a white noose around his neck appears behind him. Next, we see a background image of another black person being choked, right as Fantano says the words, choked to death. He's playing the specter of black suicide and death for laughs. A total misreading of the meme to frame it as a lynching joke when it's simply a man pretending to hang himself with toilet paper. It's wholly irrelevant, as it was simply in reference to a trend that had gone viral on Vine at the time. Toilet paper, not a noose. Which, if you didn't know, has been a pretty viral internet meme over the past year or so. Kids blowing up on platforms like the now-defunct Vine just kind of uh, 
hanging themselves with toilet paper in the bathroom. Which, once again, had nothing to do with lynching. They then argued that he only parodied black artists because he was racist, noting that that is a plan never released any parodies of white rock musicians. Maybe it had to do with the fact that just a few months later, industry outlets would claim that hip hop surpassed rock to become the most popular music genre for the first time in history. They go on to attack Fantano for including memes with the gamer word, before finally discussing the red pilling of Fantano. They discuss his association with Sargon of Akkad, how it alienated some of his audience, and then the Sam Hyde interview, where Hyde drops bass and red pilled quotes like this. I'm going to I'm going to destroy Lena Dunham physically so badly that the the the, the, the people who come to clean her up they're going to be puking when they see what I did to her. All right? I want them to know how I feel about her. So I'm going to fuck her up so bad that she makes them puke when they see her bruised, mangled body. If she ever did anything to me to warrant that legally. Now I would never ever <laughs> <laughs> Initiate violence against her. The way that you said that. But that's all what that. would happen. Okay. Okay? All right. To finally conclude his article with, in short, Fantano may have discerned from the popularity of his friends like Sam Hyde and Sargon of Akkad, not to mention his own icon status on Mew, that a market existed for reactionary video content. He understands his own audience, 94% male, according to the Spin profile, and he realized he could double his money by posting on two separate channels, one for music lovers and one for edgelords. One for people interested in his take on rap music, one for people who want to laugh at his crude rapper parodies. Hardcore fans would watch both, and then, when he deleted them, they couldn't. These screen grabs are all that's left. This leaves just one question. Deep down, what does Fantano actually want? In Gordon's profile, Fantano says that he would like to at least be treated with the same amount of legitimacy as other music writers. Even though that is the plan has been deleted, it seems far-fetched that Anthony will keep his edgier persona under wraps. As long as he continues to undermine his actual criticism with toxic cash grab bullshit, he can kiss that dream goodbye. In the days prior to the release of this article, Anthony deleted the entire channel, citing the YouTube guidelines, though the timing seems a bit too coincidental for this to be true. As you can imagine, this article didn't sit particularly well with Anthony, and it was for good reason. Following the release of the article, Anthony had an entire speaking tour cancelled, likely costing him thousands of dollars. As Digital Music News notes, tours are expensive and clubs don't pay for cancelled gigs. That leaves lots of airline tickets, hotels, and a myriad of other expenses. Some refundable, some not. And it was also used against him by artists like Vince Staples, who quote tweeted him questioning if he was a part of the alt-right. Fader probably came away from this, seeing the cancellation and prior deletion of his channel as an admission of defeat. Their expectations were swiftly destroyed when Anthony posted a video to his main channel titled The Fader Response, where he sought to defend his reputation by pointing out many of the issues with the article in a succinct 20-minute video. And while the channel has been controversial in the past, nothing I've said has been any more edgy or out there than what you might catch on a new South Park episode, or I don't know, a Doug Stanhope stand-up special, or another YouTube channel like uh, Filthy Franks or iDubs, and you wouldn't frame them as being alt-right. Keep in mind nearly all of these people have made much harsher jokes towards some of the same targets I have in my videos on my meme channel. Anthony does a great job debunking the Fader article point by point, even commenting his view of his interactions with Mew. But Anthony didn't just stop there. While the specific details are sparse, the Fader article was eventually removed in March of 2018, with a simple explanation of the claims having been settled, indicating some sort of legal action. In spite of his solid refutation, other media outlets still tried to paint Fantano in a malicious light. Spin.com, which previously had posted positive articles on Anthony, claimed that Fader tried to map out Fantano's political ideology, a far cry from the actual intent. They also claim that his fanbase attacked Marcus, doxed him, and made anti-Semitic comments about him without acknowledging even a single falsehood from the Fader article. Regardless of the fact that Anthony had clearly redeemed himself in the eyes of his fanbase, the damage from the article was already done. After the controversy, Anthony's online presence would never be the same. The article was a wake-up call for him, in more ways than one. Firstly, it showed just how sensitive his public image was and how easily he could be misinterpreted. It made it clear to him that regardless of his good intentions, he was a target. And secondly, he claimed it caused him to realize that there were some grubby, close-minded, young, aggressive male types hovering around the content. Ever since the Fader article, Anthony has distanced himself from being a provocateur 
dropping his once signature sense of humor in favor of a more milquetoast internet presence. The Fader article didn't kill Anthony Fantano's career, this much is true, but it did force him to sanitize his image, resulting in him losing much of the charm that made him so unique, and this didn't sit well with those who remember the days when he used to browse the boards himself. Anthony, someone who once resided in that area of the internet, had now become just another checkmark account, who'd drop weird, cringy takes on Twitter every so often. Just to show how much his attitude has changed, in a profile from September of 2020, he described 4chan as toxic and problematic, though acknowledging that it was where most of the internet humor drew back to. Anthony had always been a left-winger, though he now felt that it was his responsibility responsibility to advocate for social justice, as his views had become much more intersectional. He now looked down on portions of his audience that media outlets would like to take advantage of to disingenuously criticize him. It's completely understandable why he would want to move away from the edgier aspect of his career. The damage dealt to him, regardless of if he was right, simply wasn't worth dealing with. However, his turn on the audience that appreciated that part of his persona is ultimately what led many of them to grow hateful of his brand as a whole. Perhaps the reason it was so insulting was because he continued attempting to appear counterculture in spite of his efforts to be more marketable and mainstream. He became a poser to them. His disenfranchised fans were left without a voice to represent them in the culture. That is, until they met Negative XP. DVD and ecstasy conceded with no self-esteem. She's a teenage dream if you hate yourself. Negative XP, also known as Shooter, is an artist who grew exponentially in the summer of 2019, with the release of his song, Scott Pilgrim vs. The World Ruined a Whole Generation of Women. With lyrics like this, it's no surprise that it was quite popular in the based universe of the Chanosphere. The song exploded Negative XP into relevance, inspiring fans of him to create their own music videos on YouTube and accumulate millions of views themselves. In the same year that the term Doomer became a part of popular lexicon, Shooter embodied his demographic in the same way Anthony once did. Only, instead of hipsters who listened to experimental music, it was involuntary celibates who couldn't stop getting visited by the FBI. Please don't come back. The Scott Pilgrim song became the anthem against e-girls, who they viewed as nothing more than posers and groupies, and with this newfound popularity, Shooter was quick to take shots at the man many online users felt crafted their music taste, Anthony Fantano. On August 7th of 2019, Negative XP released the song, You Shouldn't Be Allowed to Listen to Music If You Watch the Needle Drop, a song where he rants about those who indulge in Fantano core. This may be hard to hear, but all the bands you like are pretty queer, like they really care about what people think, and so that's why they all lip sync, all the talking points the song is more about Anthony's audience than him, though with his ranting of people who felt their opinions on politics mattered, it obviously hit a sore spot with Fantano. In September of 2019, a Twitter gimmick account called Hot Music Takes tweeted, If you at Anthony Fantano in my replies or sent him my tweets, you are either 14 or a pedophile. Anthony responded asking why they were mad causing the account to reply to him with a negative XP song. This would be his first acknowledgement of Shooter, writing, The lyrics in the first half are the same as in the second half. What is this horse shit? This would be the start of a long saga of interactions between Anthony, his own fans, and negative XP listeners, who repeatedly told him to review his music. Fantano refused time and time again, emboldening his detractors. What the people criticizing Shooter and making a controversy of his music fail to understand about him is that he really doesn't care. I'm not saying this to be condescending. If you look at anything the guy does, it's obvious that he just doesn't really give a shit. Even his initial response to Fantano was nothing but a stupid joke. This really highlights the difference between Negative XP's mentality and Anthony. One of them has a reputation to uphold and a business to maintain. The other doesn't really have much to lose and doesn't care if someone on Twitter calls him sexist. Shooter's convictions only go as far as a gag to make a funny song. Even in the Scott Pilgrim tune, Shooter lists off a bunch of stereotypically negative traits about e-girls, before ending every chorus with, honestly, I'd still hit if I could. He even made a male equivalent about Toonami. This is not a guy with serious beliefs, it's apathy to the extreme. And this would be seen when Anthony began stoking the flames himself. On September 18th, 2019, Anthony wrote on Twitter, I'm wondering what kind of rut you need to be stuck in to be recording lo-fi incel rock songs that are all just waves ripoffs, and then upload them to SoundCloud. Yikes. Then, when someone asked if he was talking about Shooter, he responded with, ding ding ding, a clear personal attack and negative XP, one would expect the diss track Shooter responded to Anthony Fantano with to be similar. Instead, he reappropriates his tweet to question why he thinks his career is better. 
I'm wondering what kind of ride you need to be stuck in to be recording music review videos. Turns his writing style into quirks of the song, and then spends the majority of the tune just insulting Anthony's fans again. With how much he could have attacked Anthony for, in the grand scheme of things, it's very tame. The same day he released the song, Shooter then said he didn't even hate Anthony because he thought it was cool he could make a living making those dumbass videos, but he definitely hated the people that watch and support his videos. And this is also reflected in his later responses, where he just doesn't take any of it seriously. One of the artists for his collective, MSG, drew art of Anthony and Shooter just hanging out together. Just chilling out. Anthony's response to a similar piece of art was to mock Shooter for being suspended, while Shooter's response was to say that it was beautiful that music could bring them together in spite of their disagreements. Beyond any obvious political rift, the difference here is clear. Anthony cares too much about being on the right side of history and remaining clean in the eyes of modern e-celebrity dumb, while Shooter doesn't care at all. And even if you agree with Anthony's position, you have to admit that he just comes across as uptight in contrast to Shooter's careless attitude. To address someone in a somewhat similar position to Anthony, let's visit Filthy Frank or Joji. Filthy Frank was one of the best creators on the platform, and also someone who represented the edgier side of YouTube that the media was so afraid of. While Joji wasn't in love with his former audience, he respected it in the time in his life when it was his path. Once he moved on to music, he thanked them for what they had done for him and made it clear that they had the option to continue being a fan of his work or stop short of the music and just enjoy what he used to do, free of any derision or malice. Anthony, on the other hand, lashed out at his fans of the past, making them inherently hostile and in the process, lost what made him unique. The appeal of Fantano as a critic, and as a creator, is that he brought back the art of reviewing music for the modern age, appealing to internet culture and crowds of people that the mainstream would rather ignore. He gave voices to underground artists, and participated in a subculture that quickly became enamored with him. Once it was no longer beneficial to his brand, he grew to hate it. To call back to 2016 Emplement again, the dude became a normie. I know in more recent times I've become known for going after people for more career-ending criticisms, and I don't want it to make it seem like I'm trying to do anything close to that here. I sympathize with Anthony. In the end, none of this controversy, if you want to call it that, will really affect Anthony's channel in the long run or his bottom line. He has such a large audience across his channels, and it's so diverse at this point that there will likely never be a narrative from this corner of the internet that really starts any significant wave of hate towards him, and I don't want that to happen. And this video also really isn't about negative XP. His success in mocking Anthony and the traction he managed to gain from that alone is representative of a greater trend. Anthony used to be part of the counterculture and participated in it, but due to a series of events where the media attacked him, he was traumatized by his association with that community and decided to leave it behind. But ultimately, in his attempt to distance himself from his edgier fans for fear that it would bite him in the ass again, it only bit him harder. I've been Turkey Tom, and until next time, leave me alone. <laughs>